Welcome to the Unlocking Wealth Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We will motivate and inspire you as we share strategies from successful and wealthy individuals. Here is your host, David Ordonez, an entrepreneur and real estate investor. Welcome to a new episode of the Unlocking Wealth Podcast. As a real estate investor, it is very important that you choose the right partners and it's essential to your success to select a good lender. We have trusted InstaLend for our lending needs and they have become our preferred lender for our real estate investments. InstaLend is your private lending partner where you can get a loan commitment the same day and close within days. Grow your real estate portfolio with InstaLend. Tell us about your project. We lend on all product types from short-term, fix and flip, and 30-year rental loans across single and multifamily properties. We also lend on ground-up construction and work with first-time and experienced operators. Our loan products are also available for foreign national investors. InstaLend your preferred partner for an insta-good experience. For more information, visit instalend.com. I have Jason Smiley today with me. I'm very excited to dive into your story, Jason. He's the president and principal owner of Capriotis, uh, franchise restaurant chain Capriotis Handle Shop and, and Wing Zone. Collectively, over 235 restaurants across six countries and 30 states in the United States. So, great story. I'm, I'm very excited um, to listen to it and dive into it. So, Jason, thanks for coming and, and thank you for sharing your story with us. I'm super excited to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome, Jason. Well, we'll just dive in into it. I mean, I, I would like to learn a little more about your story. I mean, how, where did you grow up? Where are you from? How did you get into the fast food business? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. So, you know, I'm probably as Vegas as you get, but from Los Angeles originally. So I moved to Las Vegas in 1990 when I was eight years old. My, uh, my dad had uh, a business and his uh, business was doing some work out here. And so we picked up um, all of our stuff and moved from California and made the trek out to Vegas before it was super popular to do so. And, um, you know, grew up here and uh, went to, you know, high school, UNLV for, uh, for undergraduate and grad school. and What was your major? So I, undergrad, I was computer science okay. with a math minor. Um, and then right after undergrad, uh, while I was starting in my old career, I uh, went straight into uh, graduate school and got my MBA as well. Okay, in, in, oh, that's great. And then uh, how do you, um, so this is your graduating from, ha- from college at what year? What is this? I uh, graduated from undergrad in 2003 okay. and then uh, took, I think, about three years to get through my MBA as well. Okay. So at this moment, you have no um, relationship with Capriotis. So my relationship with Capriotis actually started back in college. And okay. um, uh, I was interning for Bechtel Nevada that uh, they ran the Nevada uh, test site operations and was interning for them as a software engineer and was you know just kind of uh, hanging out with friends at, at work and uh, they brought in some lunch and you know these nondescript bags with these large sandwiches poking out and um, I asked them, you know, where, what would you guys get for lunch? And they're like, Capriotis, of course. <laughs> and I'd never heard of Capriotis before. So um, instantly they were like, okay, you have to take, you have to go to Capriotis today. We're going to take you there. So um, my buddy Ifan and my buddy John uh, took me to the Sahara and the Strip Capriotis. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, this is about, you know, 2000 maybe. Okay. And, you know, uh, they, they ordered me the Bobby. And uh, it was love at first bite, right? Like it was like a, a sandwich that I've never had before. Uh, and, you know, it was just a, an incredible, incredible sandwich and just kind of had a, 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 a love for the food all throughout college. Um, and at the time, I was uh, roommates with my best friend and current business partner. and. I came home from work one day. I was like, dude, you ever, you ever tried Capriotis before? And he said no. And, um, you know, basically that whole week I nagged him and was like, you have to try this food. It's freaking amazing. 
And so, you know, about five days later, after every single day um, bugging him, uh, on on Friday, I said, "All right, you, you haven't tried it yet. I'm going to drag you over there." And uh, I tried to get to him to try the Bobby because pretty much that that's all I had that week, and that's all I knew about. And uh, he had this like sick aversion to mayo and cranberry sauce, so he wouldn't try the the, the Bobby. And <laughs> he ended up getting the cheesesteak, and uh, you know had the same ex- he had the same experience that I did. And um, so basically, you know, to put it in a nutshell, all throughout college, we just ate capriotis religiously. And that was that's kind of how, how you guys got yeah start off universe. start off as customers. Awesome. Now Capriotis was founded in 1976, mm-hmm. and in Delaware. Yes. Okay. So how after you graduate from college, obviously you love Capriotis, you love the concept, the menu, the food as, as customers. How do you make that step to become eventually the owners of Capriotis? So the, the process, you know, like I mentioned, uh, you know, my, my best friend and business partner, we've we've been friends since we were little kids about the same. Actually, we know we knew each other from Los Angeles. But, oh, wow. Um, nice yeah, yeah, since we were little kids. But we always talked about going into business with each other at some point in our lives. And, um, you know, fast forward, we graduate college and we're doing well in our respective careers. Um, myself, I went to um, work for Bechtel, um, same place I was interning at, and um, became a software engineer and later IT project manager for them. And Ashley, my business partner, uh, he was a portfolio manager for Wells Fargo. Okay. So, you know, we were both doing well, and um, we kind of caught, uh, you know, the right, the right edge of the real estate wave around that time, and you know, had begun to accumulate a little bit of wealth and. It was about the right time to think about, you know, diversifying and getting into business. And um, you know, we 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 said we were going to have this um, business meeting, and we were going to bring all all of our ideas of what we were going to do. And uh, we got this like room in the library, and we went there, and there was a whiteboard, and we were like, "All right, we're going to figure it out now." Mm-hmm. And we each came with one idea, and uh, the the only idea we both came with was to become Capriati's franchisees because we we're just still eating this food religiously. We love the product and, and, have and you're things. and you're also seeing an opportunity for growth, obviously. Because it's just, at this moment it's a smaller franchise, right? Maybe I don't know how many units when you guys acquired it. Yeah, when we acquired it it was somewhere between thirty five and forty. So it's, it's um, a so. small in the in the ocean of, of the fast food industry, of course. And and then at that moment is your is your is what you guys decide let's go after it yeah so you know we were still roommates actually at the time and um one of the restaurants opened up um, pretty close to our house and just going and being there as a customer and started to you know kick the tires a little bit and ask the, the the franchisee how they were doing and what their experience was like and you know she couldn't speak highly enough about um, you know, how well the business was doing, right? She said from day one, they had customers and the customers loved the product and she was cash flowing. The profitability was good, um, you know, pretty right off the bat, which, you know, for us was uh, a lot of validation when you hear from a franchisee that they're doing well and not the franchisor, um, you know, it's a good sign. Right. And, um, but what we saw in Capriati's, um, if, you know, if anybody's familiar with what it used to be, um, you know, it was really a mom and pop sandwich shop that, you know, grew um, with uh, family members that founded it from Delaware. Um, they uh, franchised with their friends and family in Delaware. They moved out to Vegas in the early 90s. How many locations they had in Vegas uh, at this moment? At this moment, uh, not a whole bunch, maybe like 13, 14. Okay, so, so but they're so. not they're not a small item. I mean, they have some presence in town. Yeah, right? so they came to Vegas in 1993. Okay. Um, so this is about 10 years later. Okay. Um, so while they franchised mostly with friends and family in Delaware, came out here, it was mostly ended up being you know, some friends and family, but mostly fans, you know? Okay. And, uh, but it was still kind of this, you know, mom and pop brand sandwich shop. Like the lure of, of Capriati's was just the product. Yeah. Um, you know, the... The Sahara on the Strip location that I went to um, when I tried it for the first time, you know, there's just, you know, not a lot of sparkle, right? Like the sparkle was really in the food. Um, And so what we thought is that, you know, we could bring at least some of our acumen and and our business experience and, you know, be successful as franchisees because, you know, without a lot of marketing and a lot of, um, you know, basically no frills you know these these restaurants were doing well so the, what year do you guys acquire the you guys acquire franchise 
Yeah, so we, we became franchisees in 2004, 2005. Uh, we convinced the owners, uh, the founders, to let us franchise one unit. Um, at the time, they thought that there was, uh, you know, the whole the whole uh, city was pretty much saturated with, like I said, about 13, 15 stores. And um, they said there's no room to put any more capriati. So we said, okay, well, you know, let us build all the way out in Henderson uh, as far as you can go, which was back then, you know, around Stephanie and 215. Right. And yeah. so uh, we we picked a, you know, a spot and um, they said we could build uh, one restaurant. So with the idea in mind that, you know, we had no room to grow, uh, you know, we were already looking for any opportunities for acquisition. And so while we were building our first one, uh, the next closest one on uh, Eastern and Horizon Ridge came up for sale. And we ended up acquiring and operating that one before our first one was built. Okay. And then so this is, like I said, about 2005. Um, so we operated those two locations. I was still at my um, my old job. Uh, you know, those those shops were uh, being operated by um, some good friends and Ashley's uh, girlfriend at the time, now wife. Okay. And um, at store three, um, however, you know, kind of like the light bulb really clicked. And, you know, we, we looked at these three units um, yeah, and realized, I, I mean, I, for me personally, um, you know, working in the government space was, you know, not what I really envisioned for the rest of my life. Um, wasn't exactly the culture I wanted to be in. And financially, you know, these two locations were starting to provide uh, a, a, lot, a lot more of an opportunity than I could see myself growing into in, this, in the other business. So at store three, it made sense for me to, you know, leave my career that I'd studied for and everything and, you know, begin to oversee the Capriati's business full time. Um, so that year we opened up our, our third location. Um, and also, you know, as, as we were looking at opportunities to grow even further, since Las Vegas seemed like it was, you know, saturated. getting pretty saturated, uh, which in hindsight it wasn't, but, um, you know, we were prepared to, you know, pick up shop and move to Arizona or Utah or somewhere else and, you know, open up a large territory as area developers. Right. So we had room to grow. Okay. So kind of through those conversations with the founders, um, we came to the conclusion that, you know... And one, at this moment, you already, you quit your other job at this moment when, when you acquired the third location. So yeah. you're going full time, 100% with Capriotis now. I was committed to, committed to doing something in the restaurant franchising okay. space. Um, at the same time, while well, um, we were also looking at becoming perhaps Buffalo Wild Wings franchisees okay. in Reno. Um, and... Um, but like I said, through this, these conversations about expanding, uh, we came to learn that, you know, number one, uh, the founders really couldn't get comfortable with anybody taking off that big of a territory considering it was only about 40 restaurants um, at that time anyways. And uh, we also realized, you know, they had real no next of kin to pass along the brand to and we're getting near retirement age. And there were rumors that, you know, they were beginning to think about selling the company. So... Um, Ashley, my partner, you know, he came up with a, a really light bulb moment one day and, uh, you know, came up with the idea to, to make an offer to acquire the brand. Um, so we did that in 2007. Okay. To um, acquire the brand. We made an offer to acquire the brand okay. and put the company into escrow and then uh, spent 2007 uh, raising capital. Um, and then January 1, 2008, right when kind of the whole world started to collapse, uh, we, we acquired the brand and were the owners of, of Capriotis. Capriotis. How many uh, units does the company own and how many units are franchised when you guys acquired it? Um, when we acquired it, um, I remember, I don't remember the exact number. It was somewhere, you know, in the, in the high thirties in total restaurants. And like I said, we had three restaurants at the time. Uh, we sold two of our three restaurants to raise capital for the acquisition and then held on to one unit to have a company owned restaurant, okay. um, because I firmly believe in any franchise system, you also have to operate as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, so the sale is finalized in 08 and then you guys acquire the company um how is the process of you implementing your new business culture into the company dealing with new franchisees that they used to be family and friends from the old owners i mean is there some resistance is it easy transition is it smooth 
it was very challenging. <laughs> you know, it, it, at the time, you know, we were we were 25 and 27 years old, and yeah. um, you know, we when we look young, right? Like so, it was. Uh, you still you you still look young. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we looking back, I mean, we were we were kids, right? Like, and you know, while we had, I think, a lot of ambition, we I think we had the perfect amount of naivety to um, not let. Um, any of you know our fears get in the way of, right. of us. So you know we had I think the right mindset to um, really plow through whatever obstacles came our way, and there was plenty of them. Um, but you know to start out, um, you know I think our age um, was definitely uh, a pretty big obstacle in terms of um, beginning to you know grow the trust of our franchisee base. Okay. Um, you know I think there was a lot a, a little bit of um, you know, like like I said, there was a, a lot of friends and family that were in the system that you know uh, uh, put uh, some resistance. Yeah. Of being... You know, I, I think one of the challenges was that the founders continued on as part of the Capriati's brand as franchisees. So oh, and there still are. Um, so not not any longer. Um, the uh, Lois, the the main fan, founder, passed away a couple years ago, um, and uh, as, as well as D. Um, passed away, but um, Alan is is still still with us, and um, but not as a franchisee anymore. Um, and you know, having them as franchisees, um, you know, came with a lot of advantages. Um, you know, right. we could rely on their their wisdom, their wisdom, knowledge, experience. Um, but on the other side, it did make you know rapid change a little bit more challenging because you know obviously there's a lot of emotion when you know you have. You know your baby that you've, you know, it's your years. your life for thirty, yeah, yeah. yeah thirty years, and yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that that transition I think was was very hard for the founders, um, and uh, so you know while we were, we always had uh, intentions on rapid growth and you know making a lot of positive changes. Um, sometimes we didn't see eye to eye. Of course. Now moving forward, now uh, after a. Uh, what, 12 years after the acquisition of Capriotis brand, uh, what is now Capriotis? I mean, from when you guys acquired the brand to now, how many units more, the brand has changed, you've probably implemented new things on the menu, I guess. I mean, what are the biggest changes? Like how many franchisees you have now? How many more states? Yeah. I mean, tell me a little about that. Well, I'd say the, the biggest difference is back then, you know, we were... Uh, not, I wouldn't even say a regional brand. We were more of a local brand operating in two major regions, right? The Mid-Atlantic and Las Vegas. Um, and really kind of any time Capriati's tried to extend, expand out of those two areas, they, you know, ran into a lot of um, challenges and, you know, closed units. Um, today, I would say we're a national brand. Mm -hmm. um, we're operating in, you know, 30 plus states and uh, we have 170 locations, um, about you know, north north of 170 at this point, that are made up of uh, traditional brick and mortar locations. We have non traditional locations in casinos and stadiums and arenas. Um, we also have um, ghost kitchen and mobile units um, and licensed locations as well. Um, and then we operate, um, like I said, it's I think it's important for a franchisor to operate. So we operate about. Um, about ten percent of the system as well. Okay. Well, that's that's. Uh, I mean, rapid growth and expansion. I mean, uh, through the first uh, what twelve years so far of you owning the brand. Yeah, I'd say you know we've we've probably had two main phases of of growth. Um, you know, the the first kind of phase was you know us taking it from about forty units to about a hundred. Okay. At store hundred, it got kind of challenging, right? Um, we started to realize um, some of our um, early mistakes. Um, and contracted a little bit, um, but then uh, I'd say in the last five six years, um, things really started to click. Um, started uh, we took on some additional growth capital, um, some great um, investors, mentors, um, expanded our board, uh, really kind of uh, brought on some fantastic A players on, to, on A players to our leadership team, and you know uh, things really start to click when you have a fantastic. You're learning team. also. You're learning. Through all these processes, I mean, learning the industry, the, the business itself. We, we put it. We put it in our ten thousand hours. That's for yes. sure. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Outliers? Is that Outliers book? The ten thousand hours? Uh, 
Yeah, I think so. Thing is, is I think it's the outliers where it says that you got to put ten thousand hours to to make so sure. That Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm yeah, Gladwell. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, now, so twenty twenty hits, right? I mean, I was getting some facts, and twenty nineteen, I think it was like a two hundred and seventy three billion dollar industry, fast food industry, and then in twenty twenty drops because of the pandemic, and everybody's, you know, obviously freaking out. But then twenty twenty one is a huge. Um, jump again, right? Um, how was your experience through the pandemic? Obviously, um, adjusting to to what it was for that year. How was the experience for Capriori that that year? Um, well, I, I'm happy to say we were very, very lucky, and um, I like to say, you know, luck is really kind of pre preparedness meeting opportunity. Um, but uh, you know, March when lockdown happened, um, you know, we had been talking about. Uh, COVID as a senior leadership team uh, for quite a while um, and had our visibility on, you know, what the potential impacts were and we're pretty prepared, I think, for um, some worst case scenarios and just in terms of our thought process. So we weren't, you know, completely caught off guard when, you know, the national emergency hit and, um, every, you know, everything started to go into lockdown. That said, um, you know, it was like for everybody, um, you know, really no shit moment, right? Yeah. You, you know, suddenly um, all of our growth plans um, put on on the shelf. Um, you know, suddenly we're, you know, doing financial modeling and preparing for having, um, you know, not decreases in income but zero income, zero income. right? And um, you know, locations closed all over the country, and um, you know, the thought of you know franchisees beginning to fold and not pay their royalties, which is, you know, the lifeblood of our company. So, um, you know, for uh, a very short period of time, which at the t time seemed very long, right? We were, you know, in crisis mode like everybody was. Um, fortunately, um, like when I, when I mentioned luck meets opportunity, you know, we had really, I think, done uh, a lot of work preparing uh, our technology stack uh, for a moment like this, um, you know, whereas I think a lot of companies uh, in the early part of the pandemic had to scramble to um, be able to deliver and take digital orders. Um, thankfully, we had been doing that for several years beforehand. Um, and, you know, Capriati's was really founded on to-go food. Um, our tr food travels very, very well. You can you know, have a wrapped up cheesesteak, uh, you know, 45 minutes, an hour later, and it's still warm and it still tastes amazing, if not better, right? <laughs> like, so, um, you know, I think the combination of the technology and our, our uh, you know, food traveling well and our ability to deliver the food um, put us really in a, a position of strength uh, once, you know, people started realizing, oh, well, we can run online. If I'm not afraid, yeah. If I'm afraid to go to the grocery store, I can just, or Capriati's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So and then 2021 is a great year. I mean, you guys see, you know, obviously sales increase, things are opening up again. Now, the other challenges become supply chain uh, staffing. So go through that, those challenges now. But yeah, business is booming, demand is there, people are coming out, people are buying, people are eating. But now we have, you know, I'm sure you've probably um, dealt with, with those two issues. Yeah, and we continue to deal with them. Staffing, and I would say you hit it on the head. Staffing and supply chain are, you know, two of our biggest challenges right now. Um, as it is for, you know, really the whole restaurant industry, but many other industries yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, exacerbated by inflation, inflation. and, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, it's you know the whole great res resignation. I think is you know really been a cultural shift in in America and all over the world where. You know, people are realizing, uh, you know, if, as, as COVID kind of made people reflect on their lives and what they really want to do and how they want to spend their time, um, you know, it's made people, you know, think twice about, you know, what jobs they have. And, um, and it's been especially challenging for the restaurant industry, for, restaurant for sure. Industry. Yeah. What do you see in the coming future? I mean, do you see... Uh, that is going to ease up a little bit in terms of uh, supply chain and obviously staffing. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, staffing first. Um, you know, I think 
I think that companies overall are going to have to really think about you know the reasons why all of these challenges are happening and think really hard about what value they're offering to their employees if they want to make a lasting change, right? Um, for our business, you know, automation and robotics is all the talk, right? Like, you know, if you can't get get employees to um, to you know show up to work, then you got to figure out how to automate the, the jobs away. Um, so, you know, there's lots to talk about. We're you know we're implementing kiosks. Um, we're working with some of the um, you know uh, uh, largest and and leading uh, robotics players in the restaurant industry to um, kind of accelerate that. But you know, on the people side of the business, first and foremost, this is still a people business, right? And regardless of whether or not you can automate some of these tasks, the restaurant industry, I think, is always going to have that people component. Um, so I think the, the businesses that are going to be most successful in uh, staffing and retaining in the short term and the long term are going to be the ones that um, you know, provide value to their employees and you know, really are just you know, for growth good, good bosses, good culture. Um, and you know respectful you know growth yeah potential for growth is important um last um a week that i had um a, the ceo of the plaza he was telling me how challenging it is to uh, send the message to his employees about the potential for growth and that that was one of his main challenges how you can grow and in his case obviously there's one casino casino right it's the plaza but there's no other property so the challenge of keeping keeping uh, his employees motivated, um, and I think that's one of the hardest things. So, do you find that uh, to be accurate? Like keeping uh, people motivated um, when you know that there's possibly a ceiling for them. How do you keep that motivation? There? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. Actually, I was talking about this with my team at a conference last week, and um, I think you hit it on the head. Really, you know. Showcasing opportunities to grow and develop in, in, in a restaurant is really, really hard, right? I think, uh, you know, younger employees look at this as a first, you know, first, sometimes a first job or, you know, really just a place to kind of, you know, land at for a little while until they move on to college or a career. Um, but in the restaurant uh, industry and, and in franchising, you know, this can be a, a great living. It could be um, a great way to build wealth and freedom. Um, great way to build a career in any number of um, you know different fields um, within this industry, um, and you know for us, I think it's you know a, a really a really big opportunity to tell that story to potential employees, employees. and utilize some of the great uh, uh, you know platforms, uh, recruiting platforms to. Um, you know, share videos and explain how those opportunities are real. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, you know, when we were franchisees, uh, we hired a guy named named Ron. You know, he's a 17 year old kid, and uh, at the time, um, and today, he runs one of our our departments as as our uh, director of training. And oh, wow! So he grew with you guys. He that's, grew. He that's grew. A great story. He grew with us, and um, you know, there's other stories of of employees um, becoming managers or going to you know work for franchisees, or maybe great. becoming franchisees eventually. And becoming right? franchisees. Is, and that's partners. actually probably could be a great way of also sustaining growth for you because otherwise you're constantly looking for potential franchisees and investors are in different areas but if you are promoting from within to some of the employees i'm sure that a lot of them can become franchisees which will be great they already know the culture they know the business great great recipe absolutely yeah, yeah. that's great so now that's a that's obviously the, the whole side of the business that capriot is now in you guys are still in expanding mode. 2020, end of 2020, you acquire Wingzo. Yeah, so um, never in my life at the beginning of 2020 uh, would I have ever guessed that we would be acquiring another chain by the end of the year. <laughs> and not in a million years, uh, you know, in the middle of, uh, you know, while we're, you know, curled up in a ball, uh, you know, worrying if we're going to, you know, make it through the pandemic in, in March, like, I, I, I just couldn't believe that, you know, by the end of the year, we'd be acquiring a company. But, um, you know, I think uh, we we saw an opportunity. Uh, we'd always talk. We've been actually talking about um, acquisition of the right kind of brand uh, for a couple of years. And, um, you know, through the pandemic, uh, we had reached out to, 
you know, some of our, of our friends in the industry that we've known and just to kind of share war stories and see what we can learn from each other. And we had reached out to some of our uh, longest friends in, uh, in the industry, uh, uh, the founders of, of Wingzone. Oh, and, you know, just through conversations of them organically, um, you know, we came to learn came to that they were shopping it around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for us, Wing Zone really was a great opportunity because it was a very similar story to Capriati's in that, um, you know, the founders had done an amazing job creating this storied brand with a great history, um, great product, um, you know, really carved out a niche in their spaces. Um, you know, the, the leaders in delivery in the wing business. Um, well, Capriati's, you know, really relied on, uh, you know, having the best food. Um, wing Zone was very focused on, you know, being able to deliver food, uh, great food, great wings. And, uh, you know, they really carved out a unique space in the wing business. So, um, but, you know, they, they, they kind of ran into some challenges in expanding it um, past um, a certain level. And, uh, many of those challenges were problems that we had already solved at Capriati's. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the the opportunity was that you know we could we had seen this movie before. We could apply so many of our learnings to another brand, and all of our processes, our people, and our infrastructure. Um, you know whether it's a wing business or a sandwich business, can we can apply it. We can synergize. We can you know utilize our franchise sales team to you know. Promote both brands. Promote both brands. Yeah. So you acquire Wingzone 30 units when you, when you, when you acquire it. And, and they also have some international um, presence, right? I saw Guatemala, Panama, Malaysia, Singapore. Yeah, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines. Oh, well, that's, that's also, it gives you an exposure internationally for Capriotis. So it's a win-win when you guys acquire Wingzone because obviously they have some of the presence internationally. Now you can push both brands. Um, what are the big plans for this year in terms of expansion for both brands now? Um, what, what, what do you have ahead now? I mean, are you quite, uh, thinking acquiring more brands or building these two brands? What's, what's... Well, we're not actively shopping for new brands right now, um, but uh, you know, who knows what the future holds. Uh, but our vision for Capriati's um, as the umbrella chain has been consistent since we acquired the company. Um, and that's 500 profitable shops all executing our uncompromising standards of quality and service. Admittedly, the dates kind of changed as you know we've, we've gone on, but uh, currently we're targeting the end of 2025 to accomplish that vision. And you know, I would say this year feels like the breakout year. Um, we have currently between both brands, uh, you know, about 68 stores that are in the you know, real estate and construction pipeline that have right. a chance of opening this year. Um, and uh, for us, that's you know, way more restaurants than we've ever opened before. Um, so you know, the, it's starting to hockey stick a little bit, okay. um, which brings yeah. a lot of challenges. A lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. We never, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're scaling. Um, so it's it's uh, it's exciting. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think the the story around Wing Zone is really awesome. Uh, we've sold a lot of restaurants. Um, we're building our first corporate units uh, here in Las Vegas. Because there isn't any Wing Zone yet in Vegas, right? Or is it already? There's not any in Vegas no. yet. So they're, they're, they were they were based in the southeast before right. we moved the headquarters out here, um, but. Um, Keep coming back. You know, we got to be operators as well as franchisor. Right. So you know, we're gonna we reconcepted the brand. Uh, you know, really cool look uh, focused on uh, delivering the food really fast. Uh, we have a proprietary process where we can uh, crank out wings in under ninety seconds, whereas our competition's mm-hmm. like ten minutes plus. Oh wow! Um, so you know, flavor really fast is our brand promise that we're going to be delivering on and. Um, we're excited to open up our first restaurant in Vegas in the next That's few awesome. months. Well, I'll, 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 I'll be there. Awesome. <laughs> now, what are the biggest challenges? Now, fast food industry, very competitive. Um, what is the biggest challenge that you see in the industry for both of your brands? I'd say right now, uh, like we talked about, supply chain and labor is is a big challenge. And I think the supply chain issues uh, stem you know not only from the food supply chain uh, but you know from equipment okay. um, and uh, inflation is a big issue as well um, you know inflation is 
um, not just impacting uh, cost of been sold, um, but it's impacting you know every aspect of the business, right? Like our contractors uh, are you know all their materials have gone up in cost, you know their labor has gone up, so you know that changes uh, you know the model a little bit. Um, and then you know equipment costs have gone up, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, and then food you know yeah. continues to go up. So um, you know, it's kind of a, a delicate balancing act okay. as we you know look at our pricing. Obviously, we want to have competitive pricing and keep our prices as low as possible for our guests, um, but also um, you know finding that kind of sweet spot yeah. um, where we can you know uh, maximize our model while Correct. also uh, yeah. having. Now, what about um, what about you as, as Jason? Uh, your mindset. How important has been that uh, throughout your business career, throughout this um, journey that you decided to go into? Right. Uh, I, I'm a true believer that everything happens in the mind first before it happens uh, actually becomes a reality. So, how important that has been for you? What has been the mindset that you had since day one when you decided to go into this journey? Um, any mentor that was key on your development? Share a little bit of that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, mindset is paramount. Um, you know, I think uh, I've developed it over you know a long period of time. Uh, it's I think didn't have the right mindset when I was much younger. Um, but I think, uh, you know, really, uh, when I think about mindset, there's really, uh, I think, three aspects to it for me that are, are super important. Um, number one, when it comes to uh, business, I think really having grit is super important. Okay. Um, you know, having uh, a commitment to, you know, persevering through any challenges that come your way, but also knowing that, you know, you can get it done, especially if you're passionate about uh, what you're working on. So that concept of grit, uh, uh, super, I think, important to success. Um, number two, uh, it's really about gratitude, I think, you know, having, you know, just really being thankful for all the good in your life, because when you're focused on what's good, more good seems to come your yeah. way. Yeah, um, and there's, boy, there's just so much good, um, no matter how you look at it. And um, number three, like, I try not to have grievances. Um, and uh, you know, just caring, you know, there's been times where I've just been frustrated with people for long periods of time. And that's always been a hindrance, I think, to, to doing well in life. So um, trying to let things go and, you know, forgiving, giving people and myself along the way is, I think, been super important. Any mentor uh, that key in your life? I've definitely had, I've been very, very blessed to have some amazing mentors. Um, you know, I think starting with my dad, uh, I, I just had a really loving family uh, from, from, you know, throughout life. And uh, my, my dad uh, is, you know, definitely uh, been a great mentor um, as he's, you know, gone through his life and his challenges. And I've, I've definitely watched him acutely. And, but in business, uh, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate. Uh, one of um, our initial uh, partners who's still with us today as our chairman of the board, his name's George Chanos, who's the former attorney general of Nevada. And right. he's become just a, an amazing friend and mentor, one of the smartest people I know. And, um, you know, um, like I mentioned, we took on some additional growth capital in the last five, six years. Uh, a gentleman named David Barr has um, entered our lives and sits on our board as well. And uh, is the uh, former chairperson for the International Franchising Association and uh, been a franchisee, franchisor. How important is uh, in business or in anything we do, Alan, sports, business, politics, whatever you want to do, is to build a good team around you, right? And uh, surround yourself with mentors and positive people. And uh, how, I mean, how important that is, I mean, in every aspect, right? What do you mean? I mean, it's it's critical. I mean, you can't do anything, I think, great in life without you know, people and doing it by yourself. Um, I don't know if you've read Think and Grow Rich before, yeah. but, you know, the whole concept of having a mastermind, yeah. um, you know, I think plays out over and over and over in, in, in so many different ways and in, in great success stories. And, you know, I think that I've always uh, 
felt you know the right people come into your life at the right times um so to be very kind of attentive for when that's happening and um, foster great relationships because you know you know you never know how you can help someone else and you know they might do the same yeah yeah so um you are experiencing success in business um, and i always believe that um you know abundance is should be uh, i mean abundance should be in every area of your life not only in business family joy peace uh family friends you know um, health how does jason do to unplug the business and focus on your family on your personal growth um, what a strategy you do to disconnect yourself? What do you do every morning to wake up? I know you have a passion for the business, but what keeps you motivated every day? You wake up every day, if it's Monday or Sunday, whatever the day is, and you're like, you know, I'm ready for this. I mean, we all do things, right? What does the Jason do? Well, for me, I think it was, you know, really getting clear on why I do what I do. Um, there was there was a number of years where I, years ago where I felt really drained. I did, I kind of lost my passion a little bit. Um, but when I realized that what I'm doing is really for my family, um, which is first and foremost in my life, I got a, an amazing wife named Malia and, and four young boys and everything I do is, is to, you know, to help them and to, to, you know, grow these guys into awesome, awesome men. And, um, it's, you know, really f- focused number one on, on that purpose has okay. been a su- super motivating for me. Um, I love spending time with them. Um, I love, um, you know, making them the number one priority in my life above all else. Okay. And that, you know, having that kind of, uh, you know, priority, you know, forces you to set some boundaries. Um, and so it's been super helpful, I think, for me personally to understand where the boundaries are um, in terms of, you know, how much I work, um, you know, the... Um, you know, coming home and being able to, you know, eat dinner with my family, um, you know, be very careful about how much I travel um, so I can ensure that those, you know, that balance stays in, in place because, you know, when when my wife and I are in a good spot, like, you know, we could accomplish yeah. anything, yeah. right? And be present, right? Because sometimes uh, we, are, we are with the family, but we're not present because we're either checking our phone, the email, the call, and... Um, and I think it's so important that we really just take the phone and put it on the drawer and, and kind of be present at that moment. And kids are aware of that stuff. Kids right? know. Yeah. yeah. They know. You know, I have a four-year-old and, you know, he tells me sometimes, Dad, put your phone away. And I'm like, you realize, and it clicks. And I'm like, okay, yeah, boom. And then I can be present, even if it's 10, 15 minutes, right? But that's a challenge, right? Because everything is treated as an emergency lately, right? <laughs> Especially now with, with the technology we have. But how often is it really an emergency, <laughs> really, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I was reading a book. It's called probably you've read it. It's uh, "Don't Sweat Small Stuff." Mm-hmm. Uh, it's such a great book. It gives you such a great perspective of that. You know, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Life is not an emergency. Um, that leads to my next question. Um, I know you're a, a reader. Um, two or three books that you. Um, I, I mean, there's so many books that have impacted my life. I'm sure yours too. Share a couple with us, uh, with our listeners that, you know, you would like them to suggest, uh, you like to suggest uh, for for us to read. I love to read. Um, I just finished uh, this week a a book that I thought was really cool. It was kind of a reminder to do so many of the things that I've learned over the last, you know, 10 years or so. But um, uh, Limitless by Jim Quick um, was, uh, it was recommended to me by an old colleague and, um, you know, really kind of just touches on all areas on, on life, on how to be just high performing, including reading very fast okay. and reading a lot, which, um, you know, I definitely uh, try and do. Um, uh, on the spiritual side, um, I'm a big fan of Ram Dass. Uh, okay. So, you know, all of his books are great. Uh, be Here Narrow is kind of his most, most famous one. I mentioned Think and Grow Rich. That's you know a great one to come back to year after year after year and try to remind remind yourself of the process of attracting uh, great things into your life and uh, how to do that. But uh, so many, so many. Yeah, well, no, that's great that you share those. Um, what are you know is 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 a, is a kind of a tough question, but I always ask this because I like you to share a couple of things or skills that have 
help you or the, that you developed or sometimes, you know, um, unconsciously because maybe that was easier for you. Uh, and some probably some skills that you actually work on them to get better at it that you think are key to unlock wealth and for you, your family, you know, your, your, your company, your employees, your business um, that you think are very important to develop? Um, I would say two things um, that uh, probably trump everything else and that's learning and creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, learning how to learn um, is, you know, when you think about when I, you know, I w- went to college to and studied computer science and math and now I sling sandwiches, you know, <laughs> but, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I look back at, um, you know, what was, what was important about college aside from having fun and, you know, accomplishing something and, you know, developing a worldview is that, you know, you kind of learn to learn and, um, I think, you know, making sure that you have, uh, you know, a good process for assimilating new information, uh, uh, changing your views, um, and doing so at a much more rapid pace than other people puts you at such a huge advantage, mm-hmm. right? Um, that's why reading, I think, is probably the most you know, important and easy way to do that. No. Self-education, right? I mean, you, you can't you can't stop self-educating yourself. And I think that's when people probably, you know, come to a ceiling if they stop learning. I think that's key. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, in creativity, right? Like uh, understanding that, you know, there's many, many ways to solve, um, you know, any type of problem. Um, but I think those, you know, we're living in such a, in a world that's rapidly evolving at a faster and faster and faster pace. Like it's almost in, impossible to predict what the world's going to be like in five to 10 years other, yeah. other than it's going to be vastly different. Yeah. And so, you know, just being able to be creative about how you approach problem solving, I think is one of the most important things. Yeah. No, I 100% agree with the creativity. Um, and, and that helps you see the problem from a different perspective. And you can actually create an opportunity out of the problem. And that's being creative. So um, last question, Jason. Um, you mentioned to me that you were investing a little bit in real estate. Obviously, that's uh, uh, the asset class that we invest on a lot. That's, uh, I would say, our area of expertise. Um, tell me a little bit about your, you know, this is obviously something different from Capriotis and and, and wing zone, but um, tell me a little bit about your investments. Yeah, outside of Capriati's and wing zone, um, I'm you know been looking for opportunities to um, you know unlock some wealth, mm-hmm. and uh, you know through through um, along the way, I've met some great people um, that have been very successful in the space and in the commercial real estate space to, in particular. Um, so you know through some development partners, uh, we've made some. Some investments in in properties around Vegas, and then done some on my own in in outside of Las Vegas uh, with my partner. Uh, you know, uh, somewhat related to Capriati's, but uh, mainly commercial, only commercial, all commercial retail. Uh, yes, retail. Okay, so commercial retail. Okay, and some office space as well. Office spaces too. Okay. Yeah. What What do you see a, the future of retail? Uh, with everything that took change, that it was taking change already before the pandemic with everything obviously online and Amazon and uh, online shopping uh, that has been affecting, you know, some of the retail stores. What, how do you see now that post pandemic, what are the opportunities and the challenges on the, on the commercial re- uh, retail? Space? Yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I'm not sure the pandemic changed any trend in particular, but I think accelerated many trends, right? So I think overall, you know, the retail trend was going to more online, uh, more online uh, commerce and, you know, less of a need to physically go places. So, you know, you're already seeing that trend happening uh, prior to COVID. Um, when it comes to, you know, the food space, um, you know, restaurants are looking to, you know, shrink down in size, especially as we experience all these cost pressures, um, you know, really maximize every, every uh, square foot in the restaurant in terms of the revenue. Um, and then you're seeing, you know, as, as 
you know, retail contracts, you know, a shift to experiential things, right? Like if you're going to actually physically go someplace, um, you know, you have to have a reason to go there, right? right? Whether it's to, you know, eat at a great restaurant that has a great experience with great food or to go there to, you know, do something. Mm-hmm. Um, great example, my development partner uh, is uh, developing a, a property uh, here in Las Vegas and um, one of his marquee tenants on the property is called Electric Pickle. Mm-hmm. And so it's this awesome pickleball concept um, that's now, you know, kind of an anchor to this uh, massive uh, development, but um, it's this, you know, great uh, draw to the center because, you know, people are physically doing something and they have a reason to go there. So I think, um, you know, that's going to be a, a continued trend for sure. It's, it's crazy how everything changes so fast now. Huh? Well, um, Jason, uh, good luck on the growth of Capriolis and, and Wing Zone. I would love to um, to go to the grand opening of Wing Zone, uh, your first one in Vegas. Um, good luck on your real estate investments. And uh, thank you for coming and sharing your story and, and um, sharing uh, some strategies to unlock wealth. Hey, thanks so much to ha- for having me. It was fun. Awesome.